Hello and welcome to another GIS report. Reporting for the Ministry of Health and Social Development, I am Public Health Communications Specialist Natasha Letsum. Today on the program, we will be sharing some information regarding the Parole Board of the Virgin Islands. Our guest today is the Chairman of the Parole Board, Mr. Deniston Fraser. What is the role of the Parole Board and give us an idea of who the members are. The Parole Board is, uh, has been established by the Parole Act 2009 and our role is basically to interview the uh, applicants for parole mm -hmm. and uh, we not only interview them but we go ahead and we assess the various documents that were submitted mm -hmm. and we determine risk. I want to say that the overall and overarching theme here is protection of the society. So whatever we do, we do it with that in mind. And we interview the applicants, we review all the documents submitted, and we assess whether or not there is, uh, uh, if this particular prisoner is released, whether or not this prisoner would be um, a risk, basically, to the society. Our members are seven, including myself as chairman. We also have Ms. Colleen Farrington, we have Mr. Trevor Grant, we have Mr. Paul Ricketts, Dr. Thomas Alexander, we have Kia Huggins, and Ms. Chanda Jeffers. Those are the members comprising the board. While balancing public safety, how do you ensure that the parole process is professional, that it has integrity, and it's fair for the people who are using the service? Well, for one thing, we ensure uh, conflict. We, we, we definitely, if we perceive any conflict uh, that a particular member might have with a particular applicant or prisoner, we would um, excuse ourselves uh, from that particular meeting. As a matter of fact, in our very recent meeting, we did have two persons who thought, look, I know these prisoners too well. And what they did was they just excused themselves from that particular interview with that particular prisoner. So we just want to ensure that it's always fair, it's always uh, a balanced process. So we would uh, ensure no conflict is there. We would also uh, be, as, um, be as open with the process. Uh, it's, um, we have court reporters in the system and uh, we just want to ensure that whatever we do, it's, it's fair and it's done uh, with transparency. How do you determine if a prisoner is no longer a threat to society? Threat and analysis of, of risk is, is, could be very difficult. There is, oh, there's always going to be a risk. Uh, what we have to do is uh, determine from all the uh, analysis, all the documents provided. Also, we interview the prisoner, we would interview the, uh, the victims uh, uh, at times if they want to be interviewed. And uh, we would analyze all that we have and analyze that risk. And again, the overarching team, threat to society. We want to make sure that if this prisoner is released, that this prisoner is uh, would no longer be a threat to society or there's a, a very little chance of him re-offending again. Now, in terms of the role that the victim or the family of the victim plays, go a little bit more in depth in the process and how significant their impact is to the process. The role of the family, well, the, the, the victim himself uh, is interviewed uh, we have a parole officer on board. That parole officer would normally uh, present a report where the victim would have been interviewed. Uh, we look at stuff too as to, uh, there, there are lot, lots of referrals at times. Uh, we would have uh, even other persons interviewed, for example, uh, who would assist the prisoner or the parolee if the, that person is paroled. Once they get out, we would have persons indicating whether or not they would be able to assist this person, uh, house this person, support this person in any way. So uh, those are things that we, we look at uh, to ensure that um, once that person is released, that he would be able to rejoin the society in a normal manner. 
In terms of other agencies that you partner with to get the necessary information, who do you work with and what type of information do you have as part of the process? Well, we start at the prison. We have um, all the relevant information from the prison, the wing officer's report. We have a report from a chaplain of the prison. We get a report from the superintendent of prisons himself. And any particular, and these reports would, would, would mention whether or not this person, their behavior in prison, whether or not they attended the, the services there, uh, generally to ensure that uh, they were uh, a, a report from the counseling person there at the prison to indicate whether or not that person had attended any of the sessions. They have a few different sessions at the prison. Uh, we will also get reports from the DPP office. We'll get a, a report from the High Court Registry. It's, if possible, we always try to get the judgment on conviction and, if possible, a judgment on sentencing, on sentencing from the High Court. Uh, so we get any police reports, any reports from the High Court, uh, the report from the prisons, and uh, those are stuff that we analyze. Uh, of course, most important is the parole officer's report. And then we take those together, analyze those along with the, uh, the interview himself of the prisoner on the day of the hearing. Usually we would have the prisoner being interviewed. Is there a role for the governor and or the minister for health and social development? Yes. Uh, the, the parole board is actually uh, a myth there is that we release or we don't release. We're actually a recommending body. What we do is we recommend release or non-release to the governor and the minister. And the final decision really belongs to the governor and the minister as to whether such a person would be released. What considerations do you look for before granting parole? Before granting parole, as I said, we would look at all of the documents submitted before us, uh, we in, particularly, in particular, we would look at the rehabilitative programs that the prison would have or may have. Uh, there's several programs, the Houses of Healing, uh, there, there are other programs there that they have that the prisoner would take to, in order to be rehabilitated. Uh, and, you know, re-enter society as this uh, quote-unquote normal person again. Uh, so we definitely would ensure that those, those uh, programs have been adhered to, uh, that the prisoner did attend, because we, we just don't want to release someone and that person has not been rehabilitated. That person has not attended one session, one counseling session. That person was uh, misbehaved basically in prison. That person did not attend maybe the houses of healing. I know that they have anger management classes even there at the prison. If, if that person did not attend an anger management uh, class then you know who are we then putting back into society? Someone that's not been rehabilitated. So we look carefully at those those items. Who can apply for parole? Uh, the Parole Act indicates that anyone uh, who has been serving a uh, sentence of uh, four years or more can apply for parole at midterm that sentence. When they reach the halfway mark, they then could apply for parole. Except, of course, it's a prisoner on life sentence. However, I must say that the judge at any time could, in passing a life sentence, determine that parole will be available for that prisoner at any time, at any given time they would be eligible for parole. So the judge in passing the sentence might say, okay, you're eligible for parole after 10 years or after 15 years. So, and that's for life sentence. So then at that point, that is when the person becomes eligible. But in general, it's for persons who have to have served, who is serving a sentence of at least four years, four years or more. When they reach the half mark, then they're eligible. How should a prisoner apply for parole? Well, the prisoner should always apply for parole at least 60 days in advance of the hearing. The hearing is usually uh, conducted in, January, in, sorry, in April and in October of each year. So we expect that the prisoner would apply to the superintendent of prison by 
the January or the July of that, that, that year. And once the superintendent of uh, prison receives that application, he would then forward it on to the parole secretary who would uh, inform the, inform the chairman and to the board. Then the meeting is called. Uh, the prisoner uh, is then interviewed by the parole officer. Parole officer does extensive work in terms of uh, interviewing, like I said, the victims and anyone else who has to be interviewed. The secretary would then, of course, uh, ensure that she receives the relevant documents I spoke about earlier from the DPP, from the parole officer, from the high court registry, police department. She would then compile those documents, pass them on to the uh, parole board. What we would normally have is a pre-hearing which takes place at least two weeks prior to the uh, parole hearing itself. So at that pre-hearing, we would go through the documents, ensure that we're familiar with them, uh, discuss them a little bit. We also make sure that uh, if there's anything that's missing, if there's a particular document that's missing, that we, we have that two-week period where we could try to capture that document. And then on the day of the hearing, which is two weeks later from the pre-hearing, then the prisoner himself or herself is interviewed. And it's from there we do a risk assessment. After parole is granted, what happens then? Okay, if I could just rephrase that a little bit and say what, what happens if the uh, parole board recommends for, for parole. Uh, we would recommend, of course, to the governor and the minister for parole. Uh, we try to do that uh, as soon as possible after the hearing, at least within one month. Uh, and then the governor and the minister would review and they would make a determination as to, okay, this person is uh, uh, someone that's eligible for parole and they would make a determination on that. Explain the term prisoner on license. Prisoner on license is just, um, a license is basically a condition. The condition for which you are being, the conditions on which you're being released with. Uh, so um, depending on the prisoner, depending on, on the offense committed or maybe even their background, uh, we may have a, a, a statement basically saying you're not allowed to consume alcohol, for example. You should be at, attending or visiting the parole officer at least twice per week. Uh, maybe it might have been a sexual uh, case. Uh, you're not to be seen in the area of the victim's residence, for example. So those are just conditions attached to the license. So it's, it's, it's almost um, similar. The conditions attached to the license is, uh, is what we, we look at there. At what point would you cancel or revoke a license? If any of those uh, conditions are breached, that's attached to the license, then a license could be cancelled. And I think there's some uh, difficulty there with cancelling and, and re revocation. Uh, basically, the license will be revoked. Mm -hmm. uh, now, as far as cancellation, uh, there may be one particular and, and this has never occurred yet, and it may or may not occur. There may be one particular condition of the license that uh, a prisoner may even apply to the governor and say, hey, we would like to have this condition removed. So I guess if you want to use the word cancellation, that particular uh, condition could be canceled. But a revocation of the license means the entire license is revoked, and the prisoner would then be returned to, uh, to his cell or to prison. How many parole officers do you have? And just go a bit more in depth on the relationship between the parole officer and the parolee. The parole officer and the parole, yes, we may have seven, or oh, we have one, seven parole members, but we have one parole officer who's full time in parole. But uh, what the Ministry of Health and Social Welfare has done is uh, allowed the social. Uh, welfare officers, I think, but some social workers are actually assigned as parole officers as well. So I'm not quite sure of the number, um, but they serve as parole officers along with the principal uh, functioning parole officers. And you mentioned the, the relationship with them and the parolee, and the, the, they of course would uh, be the ones actively engaged in interviewing 
getting the documents ready for ourselves for the meeting. And of course, if there are conditions, most of the conditions, all of the conditions, I would say, so far we've asked for the parolee, if released, we would ask for them to be meeting at least once or twice a week with the parole officer. So that, to my knowledge, is the extent of the, uh, uh, the mixing and, and, and uh, mixing with the parole officer and the parolee. What enforcement powers do parole officers have? The parole officers, uh, if a condition is breached, the parole officers would then of course inform the parole board and or the governor if, this, this, if anything is breached and it's a condition of the license, then uh, what happens is that person would then be returned to prison. He's breached the license. Speak to the breach of a license. It will be our recommendation from the parole board that that happens, correct. Tell us a bit about the purpose of the system and how do you see it benefiting society and the parolee? Well, the, the, the purpose really is to, uh, to have prisoners rehabilitated. Uh, we just don't want a prisoner to be in prison and just passing the good time along, the five years, six years, whatever it is. We encourage them to be rehabilitated, to attend the sessions in a prison, to attend uh, the counseling services, to attend the anger management program. I think there's a program called Just Think. Attend that program, attend the houses of healing, and hopefully they will be rehabilitated uh, uh, to an extent once these programs are offered. And uh, we just, we just uh, hope that prisoners would really uh, do their best to attend these sessions so that they would be rehabilitated. Being rehabilitated, the prisoner then, um, of course, the benefits would be, you know, they would be released and be able to uh, attend, you know, be, be released basically and be with their families. Uh, the, fa the society in general, uh, benefits-wise, we would have had a system that I think would be working once the uh, parole officer attends these sessions. Uh, that parolee then returns to society and hopefully would be a, a normal functioning individual where there would be a less chance of reoffending in the society. What challenges do you see with the system? We've been seeing a lot of sexual offenses, cases coming before us and what we would like to see is uh, a more structured program for sexual offenses, where we have some uh, professional engaged in the system who could really uh, relate to these offenses, who is well versed in this area and have uh, a program in place, a structured program in place for sexual offenses, so that someone uh, committing a sexual offense and in prison is not just going through maybe the houses of healing and the anger management and so forth. But it will be a dedicated program and in terms of showing them how to cope with their behavior uh, and, and really make that person or that prisoner a better person in the end. I think that is, I think that is the significant challenge, uh, not having a professionally run and structured program uh, relating towards the sexual deviant behaviors in the prison. I know that you've already started having hearings. Tell us how are they going? How do you see the future of parole? Hearings has been going pretty good. We've had two hearings so far and, and two pre-hearings. We've been enjoying the sessions. I think uh, what we do is we try to get the prisoner as he enters the room. A lot of time they come into the room very uptight and you know you know, just don't know what to expect. So I think the first thing what we do is try to get that prisoner relaxed. Um, I'm introduced, the entire uh, room is introduced to the prisoner and try to tell him, hey, we're not trying you. We already been through the, uh, the court case. We're not here to retry you. We just want to get a feel for what have you done in prison? What have you done to rehabilitate yourself? And just ask questions throughout the interview to, to analyze the risk of that prisoner uh, reoffending if he is released in, in society. So uh, I, I would say the hearings have been going pretty, pretty well so far. And what are your final thoughts? Uh, well, my final thought again is that, that that one that I think is really troubling in terms of getting the, the professional person 
um, engaged in the prison, whether they are there on a full-time basis or if they are attached maybe to the BVI Health Services Authority, I don't know, but some, some structured program needs to be in place so that these prisoners, and um, we've already reached out to the, the governor and the minister about this, and we're pretty sure that they will be doing something uh, hopefully very quickly uh, in terms of getting a structured program for the sexual deviant uh, offenders in place. Thank you for tuning in to this GIS report. Reporting for the Ministry of Health and Social Development, I am Public Health Communications Specialist Natasha Letsom. Thank you for tuning in. Mm -hmm.